This is Space Time Series 26, Episode 107. Coming up on Space Time, have scientists just discovered the origins of the solar wind? Looking for signs of the earliest life on Earth in outback Australia. And things are getting busy aboard the International Space Station. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have discovered tiny jets on the sun that could be the source of the solar wind, a constant stream of charged particles flowing out from the sun and filling the solar system. The joint ESA NASA Solar Orbiter spacecraft observed a multitude of these little jets of material escaping from the sun's outer atmosphere. A report in the journal Science found that each jet lasts between 20 and 100 seconds and expels plasma at a rate of about 100 kilometers per second. So, could these jets be the long sought after source of the solar wind? The solar wind is composed mostly of protons, neutrons, alpha particles, and large chunks of magnetic field. Collectively, these are called a plasma, and the plasma propagates outwards through interplanetary space, colliding with anything in its path. When large enough chunks of the solar wind collide with the Earth's magnetic field, it produces spectacular auroral lights, the aurora australis and aurora borealis. But these space weather events can also produce geomagnetic storms. These can be powerful enough to fry the circuits on satellites and spacecraft, cause elevated radiation doses for crew in orbit, disrupt communications and navigation systems, and even black out power grids on the Earth's surface. Although the solar wind is a fundamental feature of the sun, understanding how and where it's generated has proven to be elusive and has been a key focus of study for decades. Now, thanks to its superior instrumentation, Solar Orbiter has taken astronomers an important step closer. The data comes from Solar Orbiter's extreme ultraviolet imager instrument. Images of the sun's south pole revealed a population of very faint, short-lived features that were associated with small jets of plasma being ejected from the sun's atmosphere. The study's lead author, Lakshmi Pradeep Chita from the Max Planck Institute, says they could only detect these jets because of the unprecedentedly high resolution and high cadence images being produced by Solar Orbiter. The images were taken in the extreme ultraviolet channel, which observes million-degree solar plasma at a wavelength of 17.4 nanometers. Analysis shows these features are caused by the expulsion of plasma from the solar atmosphere. Researchers have known for decades that a significant fraction of the solar winds associated with magnetic structures known as coronal holes. These are regions where the sun's magnetic field doesn't turn back down towards the sun. Instead, the magnetic field lines simply stretch deep into the solar system. And plasma from the sun can flow along these open magnetic field lines heading into the solar system and generating the solar wind. But the big question was, how did the plasma get launched? Now, the traditional assumption's always been that because the corona is hot, it will naturally expand and a portion of it will escape into space along the field lines. But these new results look into coronal holes situated near the sun's south pole and the individual jets that were revealed challenge the assumption that the solar winds produced only in a continuous steady flow. It turns out this flow is not actually uniform. The ubiquity of the jets suggests that the solar wind from coronal holes might originate as a highly intermittent outflow. Now, the energy associated with each individual jet is small. Let me put it this way. At the top end of coronal phenomena, you have your X-class solar flares. These are humongous and can blast at the Earth, causing magnificent geomagnetic storms, major space weather events. At the lower end of the scale are so-called nano flares. There's millions of times more energy in an X-class flare than what there is in a nano flare. And these tiny jets discovered by Solar Orbiter are even less energetic than that, manifesting around a thousand times less energy than a nano flare and channeling most of that energy into the expulsion of the plasma. But their ubiquity, implied by the new observations, suggests they're expelling a substantial fraction of the material which we see in the solar wind. So they're really tiny, but there are lots of them. At present, solar orbit is still circling the sun close to the equator, so these observations across the South Pole are being seen at a grazing angle. 
It's hard to measure some of the properties of these tiny jets because we're seeing them virtually edge on. But in a few years' time, astronomers will get a very different perspective. That's because solar orbiter's trajectory will gradually incline its orbit towards the polar regions. At the same time, the activity on the Sun will continue to progress through the solar cycle and the coronal holes will be popping up in many different locations, thereby providing scientists with unique new perspectives. This report from ESA TV. Built by Airbus in the UK, engineers had the challenging task of designing a mission capable of observing the Sun as close as 42 million kilometres away, within the orbit of Mercury. The spacecraft has a number of key new technologies that have been developed just for the purpose of flying close to the Sun. We have a specific heat shield designed just for solar orbiter that will reach temperatures of over 500 degrees centigrade on the front side and will keep things as cool as just about 50 degrees centigrade on the back side to protect the sensitive electronics. The Sun generates a bubble of plasma enveloping the entire solar system. Known as the heliosphere, anything within it, including Earth, is subject to a stream of charged particles called the solar wind. Violent space weather from flares and coronal mass ejections has the potential to damage satellites, disrupt communications and knock out power grids on the ground. Solar Orbiter will help answer fundamental questions about the sun's activity. One of the key questions the scientists have is how the heliosphere is actually generated and how it's accelerated. So what is, what is really um, driving the solar wind? And the second key question of the mission is understanding uh, what makes the sun change or vary over this 11-year cycle that we all know. So understanding the, uh, the magnetic properties of the sun and how these uh, change over this 11-year cycle is one of the key scientific objectives of Solar Orbiter. To measure the magnetic environment around the Sun, Solar Orbiter is fitted with extremely sensitive instruments. And to capture the closest ever pictures of our star, the heat shield has peepholes through it, covered by protective doors. We are going to places where no other solar telescopes have been before. We are going to be very close to the Sun to take very high resolution images of the Sun unprecedented uh, spatial resolution and we are also going to fly over the poles of the Sun, regions that are very much unknown because we don't see them very well from Earth, but they are the source of the fast solar wind and therefore are very important. To reach this orbit after launch, Solar Orbiter will use the gravity of Venus and Earth over the course of several years. Solar Orbiter is building on the rich legacy of ESA's previous missions to the Sun, including Ulysses and SOHO. In orbit around our star for more than 20 years, SOHO is still returning spectacular images. This solar mission will complement NASA's Parker Solar Probe. We will not get as close to the sun, but we will have a vastly bigger payload complement, so more instruments with more cameras looking at the sun. So we will do science that is complementary to Solar Probe, and the two will really have a great deal of synergy. Scientists and engineers have been working on ESA's Solar Orbiter mission for more than 20 years. They can now look forward to unravelling the mysteries of the Sun. This is Space Time. Still to come, looking for signs of the earliest life on Earth in outback Australia, and things are getting busy aboard the International Space Station. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Geologists and astrobiologists with NASA have been scouring the Pilbara region of outback Western Australia looking for some of the earliest signs of life on Earth. The expedition, which includes scientists with the European Space Agency, the CSIRO and the Australian Space Agency, are actually studying what signs of ancient life look like so they have a better idea of what to look for as they continue to explore the red planet Mars. Eric Eanson, the director of NASA's Mars Exploration Program, says the more scientists learn about Earth's evolution, the more they can apply that knowledge to their characterization of the red planet. And the outback Pilbara region is one of very few places on Earth that hold an intact geological record of the planet's early history, including some of its earliest known geological samples and some of the earliest samples of life. 
Now, specifically, this team is searching for fossilised stromatolites, mats of microorganisms that have been in existence for over three and a half billion years and are thought to have supplied Earth with its oxygen. Living examples of these ancient bacterial structures can still be found today, mostly in sheltered coastal bays and inlets. And fossils of their ancient relatives can be found preserved in the rocks of the Pilbara region. Due to the geological and climatic processes which are continuously reshaping the Earth's surface, it's extremely difficult for stromatolites as well as other fossils to be preserved on Earth for long periods of time. So really only a fraction of past life remains in the geological record. Luckily, in the Pilbara region, the rock record's been able to stay relatively intact for billions of years. That's resulting in outcrops of geology that match the same age as what scientists are seeing on much of the Martian surface today. And that makes this area of planet Earth a critical testing ground for scientists and engineers to hone their skills for identifying signs of ancient life environments. Lindsay Hayes, the Deputy Scientist for Mars Sample Return and Program Scientist for Astrobiology at NASA, says to be able to prove that these features are biogenic, not only do you need to be able to prove that life could have created them, but you also need to be able to prove that a particular version of these features wasn't created by some other geological or chemical process. So you need to understand what else is going on in the geological record of this rock to be able to understand what you're looking at. The central theme of the field workshop is the importance of geological context when choosing sampling sites and eventually confirming the integrity of a sample's biological origin. The Pilbara is the perfect classroom for teams to study stromatolites that have already withstood the test of time and that of scientific rigour, and thereby to give scientists a better idea of what to look for on Mars. The group investigated how the environment in which these signs of ancient life were found could have been conducive or unfavourable to biology taking shape. NASA's Mars Perseverance rover has been traversing Jezero Crater, which contains an ancient river delta, ever since it landed there on February 18, 2021. It's been collecting samples of rock and regolith that just maybe contained samples of ancient microbial life from the time these rocks were formed on Mars between three and three and a half billion years ago. The exercises on the Pilbara expedition have been mimicking what Perseverance has been doing remotely millions of kilometres away, identifying samples in the field and then studying the area around them. This report from NASA TV. We can see rippled sediment, beautiful ripples here, continuing along, and it comes up to the edge and it pinches out against the side of the stromatolite and then continues over here on the other side. Beautiful. So what we're looking at here in Western Australia are what are known as stromatolites. These are rock features that were precipitated or caused to precipitate by mats of microorganisms that were living at the time, again, 3.5 billion years ago. So a stromatolite is a physical feature. Usually it's either a dome or a cone-shaped feature. And these are formed when um, single-celled organisms living together in a colony either trap and bind sediment or precipitate sediment on them. And then these photosynthetic organisms grow up. And so you see these layers that repeat in in that shape. Sometimes they branch, um, sometimes they grow, sometimes they shrink. But what it is is evidence of a colony of life uh, from the earliest evolution of life, the earliest fossils that we have. And these organisms then had their presence here on Earth captured and preserved in the rock record for all of this time. And so what we're looking for are these particular structures that these microorganisms made that are distinct from what geology normally does. So the greatest thing about Australia is that it has some of the oldest rocks and some of the best preserved rocks for all different time periods in Earth's history. 
And it's important for us to come here because what we're looking for here is the oldest convincing evidence of life on Earth. And in our search for evidence of life on other planets beyond Earth, especially Mars, it's important to understand how difficult it is to convince people of what we're seeing here on Earth as being evidence of life from 3.5 billion years ago. And if we're looking for something similar on Mars, it's a much more challenging uh, prospect. So in order for us to find a biosignature, there are actually five stages that have to happen, and all of them have to happen and in this particular order. The first is life has to exist. The second is life has to create some kind of a fossil that we can recognize and we can see as unique enough to be indicative that there was something going on there. Third, that fossil has to be preserved immediately or very soon after its form. The fourth step is that preservation has to continue for a long period of time. And then finally, we have to find it. So it either has to be eroded or it has to be somewhere where we can look at a rock and recognize that there's a fossil. That is a extremely unique um, and difficult process to have happen. So there's only a fraction of life that ever existed ever becomes a fossil. It's in fact an incredibly lucky process um, to go from life living at some point to a fossil that you can find. And so that's why building that story takes a lot of time and why it's difficult that, that any one particular feature may not be biological. But when you combine all of these things together, that is what convinces people that what we're actually looking at is evidence of 3.5 billion year old life on this planet. So trying to do this here on Earth is difficult enough, and then trying to do it from 100 million miles away with rovers that have cameras and you have to send signals that take a really long time to go back and forth, even more challenging. Earth and Mars may have had similar pasts, and the more we learn about Earth's past, the more we may be able to apply it to Mars. Now that we're collecting samples at Mars, wouldn't it be unbelievable if we were able to find something that indicated similar things that we're finding here on Earth that indicate, hey, there may have been life in the, in the distant past on Mars. And in that report from NASA TV, we heard from Dr. Martin Van Cranendock from the University of New South Wales, Dr. Mitch Schultz, NASA scientist with the Mars Exploration Program, Dr. Lindsay Hayes, NASA's Deputy Program Scientist with the Mars Sample Return Mission, and Eric Ianson, NASA's Director for the Mars Exploration Program. This is Space Time. Still to come... It's getting crowded on the International Space Station. There are 11 astronauts up there right now, and they've all got lots of scientific experiments to carry out. And later in the science report, have you ever wondered what an ancient Egyptian mummy smells like? Well, stay listening and we'll tell you. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Four new astronauts have just arrived aboard the International Space Station following a textbook launch from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The flight aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket propelling the Dragon capsule Endurance had been delayed by a day to give engineers more time to review a component in the capsule's environmental control and life support system. The spacecraft docked with the space station's Harmony Module Zenith port 29 hours after lifting off from Pad 39A. The mission was the seventh crew transfer flight to the orbiting outpost using Elon Musk's SpaceX and the NASA's commercial crew program since 2020. Boeing's trouble-plagued Starliner spacecraft should be sharing the load with SpaceX, but ongoing technical issues have repeatedly delayed their flights, with the earliest launch time now not likely before next year. The only other manned spacecraft authorised to transport crew to the space station is Russia's Soyuz, which, unlike the Dragon and Starliner, is a single-use spacecraft. The International Space Station remains a rare area of cooperation between Russia and the West in the wake of Moscow's invasion of Ukraine. The Crew-7 mission was also the most multinational, representing crews from America, Denmark, Russia and Japan. They'll join the 7 Expedition 6970 crew currently on station and eventually replace the 4 Crew 6 members who will return to Earth in a couple of days aboard their Dragon capsule Endeavour after spending 6 months on station. 
During Crew 6's time on the ISS, two Russian cosmonauts conducted a spacewalk using the Poisk airlock. The seven-hour EVA or extra vehicle activity attached three debris shields to the Razvet module. They also tested the sturdiness of a work platform, which is affixed to the end of the European robotic arm, attached to the Naoka multi-purpose laboratory module. Crew 7 will also conduct a spacewalk during their stay on station. They'll be collecting samples to determine whether the space station releases microorganisms through its life support system vents and whether those microbes, if they're there, can survive and reproduce in space. Another experiment will aim to assess the physiological differences between sleeping on Earth and sleeping in space. This is Space Time. And time now to take another look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. A new study claims that paper straws contain potentially toxic chemicals which could pose a risk to people, wildlife and the environment. The findings, reported in the journal Food Additives and Contaminants, shows that the majority of paper and bamboo straws tested contained long-lasting and potentially destructive poly- and perfluoroalkali substances known as PFAS. PFAS chemicals are often known as forever chemicals as they don't fully break down naturally in the environment. They're toxic to a range of animals and have been linked to a number of human health problems, including lower response to vaccines, lower birth weight, thyroid disease, increased cholesterol levels, liver damage, kidney cancer and testicular cancer. The study analysed 39 brands of straws made from paper, bamboo, glass, stainless steel and plastic which were randomly selected from a range of European stores and fast food outlets. They found that 18 of the 20 brands of paper straws contained the PFAS chemicals. PFAS was also frequently detected in bamboo straws. In fact, only the stainless steel straws lacked the chemicals. Paper straws used to be the mainstay of milk bars and fast food joints until the mid-1960s. That's when they gradually began to be replaced by cheaper but environmentally very unfriendly plastic straws. So eventually the pendulum swung back to paper on environmentally friendly grounds. These days those same paper straws usually come wrapped inside a sealed plastic sleeve, which sort of defeats the purpose, doesn't it? Now, while we're on the subject... Just when you thought your morning cafe latte was safe and its corrugated paper cup, comes a new study finding that single-use paper cups are just as toxic as plastic cups. A report in the journal Environmental Pollution found that the plastic film used to keep the cup watertight is often made of polylactide or PLA. It's a type of bioplastic. Bioplastics are produced from renewable resources, such as corn, cassava or sugarcane, rather than toxic fossil fuels as is the case for 99% of plastics on the market today. So PLAs are often regarded as biodegradable, meaning they can break down faster than oil-based plastics. But the researchers have now found that this can still be toxic. They found that as the paper cups break down in nature, they released polylactide PLAs, which it turns out affected the growth of other animals. Have you ever wondered what an ancient Egyptian mummy smells like? Well, archaeologists have now discovered some of the secret spices used in the ancient Egyptian mummification process based on their smell. The team have been studying the Egyptian herbal woman, Senet Ney, whose remains were uncovered in the year 1900. She lived in Egypt around 1450 BCE and was the wet nurse to Pharaoh Amenhotep II. The authors say she smelled like pine and vanilla with just a hint of bitumen. It suggested that she was mummified using beeswax, plant oils and animal fats, naturally occurring bitumen, resins from coniferous trees such as pine and larches, and a compound called cumarin which has a vanilla-like scent. Interestingly, the authors also found different balms in different canopic jars which are used to store the mummy's different organs. When they examined these, they found that some canopic jars contained substances which originated in India or Southeast Asia which highlights not just the existence, but also the importance of long-distance international trade, even three and a half thousand years ago. New iPhones on the way, longer update windows for Pixel, and a drop in global PC sales. 
With all the details on these stories and more, we're joined by technology editor Alex Sahara Royt from Tech Advice Start Live. Well, Apple has made the announcement that on September the 12th at 10 a.m. Pacific time at Cupertino, they're going to be launching the iPhone 15 range. So that'll be the iPhone 15 and the 15 Plus, and then the iPhone 15 Pro with the three cameras and the Pro Max, which is also uh, rumored to be called the Ultra, that is also rumored to have a six times optical zoom, a periscope zoom lens. Not as big as Samsung with 10 times, but look, it's all still rumors. We'll have to wait to see what Apple actually announces. In the 15 and 15 Plus, they should be in the colors of black, green, blue, yellow, and pink. And they'll probably launch a, a red model uh, sometime next year, early next year, to, to continue sales. And in the 15 Pro and Pro Max, we've got uh, the usual silver and space black, but there's a new Titan gray and a new dark blue color. And these phones are supposed to have rounded edges as well. So there's still going to be surprises, you know, faster processors and smaller bezels and other things we've talked about before, but really it's just time to wait for next week to arrive. It'll be at 10 a.m. on the West Coast. It'll be 6 p.m. in London. And for us in Australia, it will be September 13 at 3 a.m. in the morning on the East Coast of Australia. So and you'll I'll be, be awake, up, yes. <laughs> I'll be awake and I'll be watching. And already Greg Joswiak, one of the Apple executives, says that there are wonders ahead. Now, while we're on the subject of cell phones, Google are upping the number of updates. What a report says is that Google is going to offer five years of Android OS updates, starting with the Pixel. 8 series. And so that matches Apple's effectively five-year update cycle. I think Samsung also spoke about offering five years worth of updates. And this is in stark contrast to most of the other Android device makers who do get the updates from Google when Google makes them available, but they take their time to test them across the entire product range and allow users to update. And that, of course, is a security risk. If there's a known vulnerability, Google's patched it, but your phone hasn't yet got it, then your phone is able to be hacked in theory. So Apple users can update the moment that uh, Apple makes an update available, and Google Pixel users can do that as well. But what is happening here is that Google is said to be matching Apple's five years' worth of updates. And in fact, Apple actually still continues to give security updates for even some of its older devices for at least a year, if not longer. And there's been forecasts of a decline in PC shipments. Yes, IDC, the analyst firm, is uh, forecasting that PC shipments will decline 13.7% this year. But they do expect global PC shipments to return to growth, although not not to um, the height of the pre pandemic levels in 2019. We did actually have explosive years of growth in 20 and 2021, but signs of growth are actually returning. I mean, people didn't buy a lot of PCs last year because, well, they just upgraded throughout 2020 and 2021 as there was this huge rush to work from home. And of course, we have had inflationary pressures, but IDC does suggest that this year won't be as high, but 2024 will see 261.4 million shipments growth of 3.7% year over year. Uh, This shipment volume is higher than the 259.6 million units in 2018, but it's still below 2019 levels. And what else is on the website this week? Well, there's some news about IFA Berlin, the big tech show in uh, Germany. It'll be on over the next few days, and we'll have details next time we speak about the big announcements that were there. Yeah, I've also got some details on Samsung's Solve for Tomorrow competition for 2023. This is uh, supposed to be elevating the next generation of innovators. All the details are at my site, as well as uh, some information on generative AI from Telsite, an Australian emerging technology research firm. And they've also just released some stats as well about how the streaming services are going in Australia, whilst Netflix has uh, lost subscribers in Australia and it does still remain the top dog. They actually have good subscribers on in the US. All the details are at techadvice.life. Please come and check it out. That's Alex Sahara of Royd from techadvice.life. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcast, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. 
Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more Space Time, please check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Space Time YouTube channel, and on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. And Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.